Well, good morning, welcome, and uh, Merry Christmas to each of you. Today is part one of our Christmas preaching series, and next week, Pastor Steve will lead us in part final of our Christmas series, and uh, so we have a two-part Christmas series, and then, uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, love to have all of you and the guests that are with you to come on Christmas Eve that afternoon and join us uh, for our service, and that'll be uh, for families to come and, and be a part of that, and also be celebrating communion at that that afternoon, too, so just invite you to do that. Uh, before we uh, go any farther, uh, yesterday I didn't spend a whole lot of time uh, listening to uh, the news, but what little bit I caught, I probably heard uh, a half dozen times as they were interviewing people here in the Midwest that were impacted by the storms the other night. Uh, I heard at least one mayor and one governor say, please pray. And I don't know in that moment if you prayed or not, but I want to start today and uh, just pray for those whose uh, Christmas plans have been upset. And so would you pray with me, Father God? Uh, why does it take a, a crisis when uh, the things that we hold on so dearly and are just gone, why does it take a crisis before we turn to you as a people? But Father, in this moment, I do thank you that some are pleading for prayer. And so, Father God, uh, uh, we, uh, as far as I know, in this church family have not been touched personally in any way by the, the storms of the last couple of days. But, Father, many people have. And, Lord, uh, might your presence and your power just be at work in this moment to redeem this tragedy. That Father, uh, as things have been stripped away, I pray that many will turn to You. The God who's faithful, the God who's always there, the God who loves perfectly. Father, I pray for uh, churches in the states to the south, south of us who I pray, Father, that they would love their own people well, but I also pray that you would give uh, wonderful opportunities for people in the name of Jesus to share food and clothing and shelter to those that are in need. And I pray that with those material gifts, that the gift of the gospel will be lived out, but also uh, communicated Father, uh, it's easy to see in this moment the effects of sin and destruction and sadness and separation and even death. But I thank you, Lord, that for those of us who know you, that's not the end. That Jesus someday will make all things new and very good again where there will be no more sickness, death. So, Father, might we be faithful. I pray that you would give leaders of those cities and counties and states uh, discernment and wisdom in trying to determine what steps to take next. I pray, Father, that... Uh, Resources would be dispersed to those that are most needy. Father, I pray against those that would take advantage of this situation and take advantage of people and resources. I pray against that, God. And Father, uh, this morning as we gather here, uh, we're, we're present in this room and on the outside we all kind of seem, at least everyone I've seen this morning seems to kind of have it together. 
But I know, Lord, that uh, in many of our hearts and minds, there's things that are swirling. Uh, things that seem to be out of our control. Things that we're worried and anxious about. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would remind us this morning of your truth, of your faithfulness, of your goodness. And I pray today that you will uh, bless our encounter with your word, the truth of your word, and the person of Jesus Christ. So might our eyes, our minds, our hearts be open to what you have for us. In Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, uh, I would invite you please to turn to Luke chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's right there, the third book in the New Testament. And uh, we're going to endeavor to uh, do something today that, that uh, is kind of a challenge, but I think it'll be okay. And uh, I was in here yesterday afternoon, standing right here, working through it, and uh, it's pretty interesting. We've just finished a, uh, a study in the book of Ephesians, and when we go to the Gospels, we go here to the book of Luke chapter 1, uh, it's a different type of writing, okay? Uh, the book of Ephesians was a letter that uh, Paul uh, wrote to the church there in Ephesus. But this, Luke chapter 1, is what a whole bunch of the Bible is, and it's in a narrative. It's a story. It's an account of what took place. And uh, sometimes the danger when we read about people in the Bible is we read into their lives and, and we we think that what's happening in the story is the way it either should happen or shouldn't happen. And we have to be careful in doing that because uh, even King David, who wrote large chunks of the Bible, made some very poor choices in his life that we don't want to emulate, but yet it's recorded for us in the Bible. And we're going to read this morning about Elizabeth and Zechariah and Mary and the birth of John. And as we go through this, uh, I just want to use the first part of the sermon to take us through the different episodes, and I think we have them listed up here, and it's kind of like a little checklist for us on that next screen there, Jared, and these are just the, the little episodes that are in this story in Luke chapter 1, and uh, at the end, which I hope is not the last five minutes, but the last several minutes, I want to use the story to give us some uh, prompts to thinking about some truths that are in Scripture. Because we can't just look at Zechariah and say, well, that was a good thing or that was a bad thing without thinking, how does that fit within the context of the rest of Scripture? And we can't think of even Mary or Elizabeth in the same way. But when we read a narrative, when we read a story, it can help us to think of other things. And that's what I've been doing this week is, oh yeah, God is this way. Oh yeah, we should pray this way. And how do I know that? Well, there's other places in Scripture that God affirms that and commands that and tells us that. So uh, we're just going to get started, and I've even asked uh, Matt Jobson to be a deacon to help me this morning because there's some long, long, it's, you know, 80 verses a lot to cover, but we're going to do it, and he's going to help do some of the reading to keep us moving right through that. But Luke chapter 1, we're just going to get started in verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV, and if you would just follow along with me, and you have, I think, some space on the back of your bulletin, or if you brought a notebook to maybe write a few thoughts down. Uh, there is a lot here, and maybe this is one of those sermons that you need to go back and maybe listen to again and actually turn to some of the references and, and think through some of the things because you're not going to have time to write it all down. But are we ready? So God, help us to treat your word well. Open our eyes to what you have for us. Many have undertaken, 
Verse 1 of Luke chapter 1. To draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first eye witnesses and servants of the Lord. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully invested everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Luke gives us the purpose for his writing. It's the Gospel of St. Luke, he's a Gentile. He also wrote the book of Acts. If you go to the first few verses of the book of Acts, you see that he's continuing to tell the story of Jesus in this world to Theophilus. And there's just a couple of things here I want to pull out in verse 3. He says, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. There's something about the book of Luke and Luke's intentions here as a doctor, as a physician, that he wants to put down a really detailed, factual, organized account of the life of Christ to help Theophilus and to help us today understand the truth about Jesus. And verse 4, we don't have to make that up, it says, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So apparently Theophilus has been exposed to the gospel, to the story of Jesus. And Luke says, when you read my book, when you read this writing, I want you to know I'm writing it so that you will have certainty that what you believe is true. Like, these are the facts. I've collected them from the eyewitnesses. I've interviewed people. And this is the facts of the story. And so as we continue on in verse 5, so here is the story that Luke has written for us of Christ. So I'm going to ask Matt to begin reading here. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abiha. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Nice, and so you, this would be a book that you might open up and be reading to your children of a story of a couple who lived at the time of King Herod. This is the same King Herod who we read in Matthew was there at the birth of Christ that the wise men, the Magi, visited. And it's the same King Herod who, who became very, felt very threatened by a baby <laughs> and had children killed there in the region of Bethlehem. And we are introduced to Elizabeth and to Zechariah. And Zechariah has a job. He's a priest. And they're good people, godly people. That description is given there. And then verse 7, it's always interesting when you come across the, the word but in Scripture. It's just however, right? But they didn't have any children. Elizabeth was barren, could not conceive. And then to top it all off, they're really old. They're too old to have kids. And they're never going to have a family. And it ends there with this, ah, uh, right? They're both very old. Continue, Matt. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. All right, so we're going to just pause there. And I want to say that this is just another normal day in Jerusalem at the temple. Typically twice a day, in the morning and the evening, incense was, would be burned there in the temple. And so... Uh, I don't know if you have any background idea of what the, the temple area was, but there were very various courts 
leading toward the temple. And depending on your, your status in the community, whether you were a Jew or a Gentile or a man or a woman or even a priest, determined how close you could come to the most holy place, the holy of holies. And that was concealed behind a curtain and pr a priest could only go in there once a year. And at this time, there was no Ark of the Covenant in that Holy of Holies. Uh, from, from the best we understand, it was just an empty room. Perhaps there was an area on the floor that was marked where the, where the uh, uh, Ark of Covenant would have been. But right outside the Holy of Holies is a holy place. And it's also enclosed. And every morning and every evening... Three priests had a responsibility with the burning of the incense. And outside of this little area in the temple was an altar. And one of the priests would take some coals. Another priest had prepared some incense. Potpourri, I guess. Some incense, right? And the third priest would walk with them into the holy place and it was not a very big room maybe the size of this platform maybe even smaller and in the center of it was an altar of incense and they would place the hot coals there and the other priest would put the potpourri the incense there next to it and then the third priest would oh then those two would actually leave the room and closed the curtain behind them and so there was one priest left in the room and his job then was to take the incense put it on the hot coals and the smoke would begin to go up and fill the room and uh, that was a picture of the prayers of the people the prayers of that priest going up to God going up as the smoke, as that smell. And that's recorded back in the Old Testament that, that, that the incense was, was the prayers of the people going up. And even in the book of Revelation, it mentions that around the throne of God, there's bowls of incense burning and these are the prayers of the people. So every morning and every evening, that would happen. And then when the priest was finished, praying and burning that incense he would turn and leave and open the curtain back up and the the other people the priests the jews the gentiles would be out there kind of like on the on the porch behind there in the courtyard behind there and he would just come out and bless the people and then all day would take place and in the evening they would repeat the process again and so verses 8 through 10 is just describing what would happen on a normal day at the temple there in Jerusalem. Continue, Matt, please. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah. Stop there, Matt. Uh, <laughs> the normal day just got upset. Because <laughs> an angel appeared. Because Zechariah happens to be that one priest that gets to be in by the altar of incense by himself and his other two helpers have left and on this side there's a little Monara candles and he's all by himself in here and I don't know if he's praying with his eyes closed or open but somehow he sensed or saw that there was somebody else in the room with him and it's an angel what I also think is interesting Luke is going about laying out the facts. And this may be kind of hard to believe. Like an angel shows up. That's an unusual thing. And Luke just in his writing writes it as if it's just another fact, a part of the story. An angel showed up. It really did happen. I've talked to people about this. An angel really showed up. Keep going, Matt. Standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. 
He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And we can stop right there. And an angel appears in there standing to the right. And he would have seen his face really well because the candle of the Nara would have been over here on this side of the altar. And the angel says to him, God has heard your prayers. Apparently he and Elizabeth have been praying for a child. And God's heard your prayers. And you're going to have a son and his name is John. That makes it easy for parents, right? You don't have to think about a name. The name is John. And then John is going to fulfill a whole bunch of the prophecies of the Old Testament. He's going to be the one that will come before the Lord to introduce the world to Christ. And there's even this reference there in verse 17 in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of righteous, that's a direct, direct connection to the very end of the book of Malachi. Which, if you go to the very end of the Old Testament, it's the last book written there. And the last few verses predict God promises that someone is going to come with the spirit and power like Elijah who's going to cause people to begin to think about the relationship with God and each other, and they're going to, it's, he's going to have a ministry that gets into the hearts of people, of what's real. And Zechariah is like, I'm here burning incense, and I'm praying, and now this angel has this message for me. My prayers have been answered, and the angel tells him, it's not just going to be a boy, but it's going to be a really, really, really special boy, one that God has had in the works the plans forever. And here's the moment. Matt, keep going. Verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Ah, uh, listen. <laughs> Zechariah says, uh, my wife's too old. There's no way this can happen. Uh, I've been praying for it, but, uh, like, there's no way this can happen. And he basically asks the angel, so what's the proof that this is true? Like, what's the proof? Are you just playing with me? And I don't know that Zechariah had ever seen an angel before, and we don't have time to get into what that, that angel Gabriel was, was like. He showed up in the book of Daniel uh, earlier in the scriptures to Daniel, but, and he ac actually in one of those episodes says that Daniel saw him flying. So I, I Maybe that gives us a little idea that angels are moving through the air. But here he is standing there with him in the holy place. And Zechariah says, how's this going to happen? There's no way. We're too old. And then Gabriel just responds, uh, I stand in God's presence. I'm the messenger of the Most High God. Really, how dare you question God, right? Don't you know, Zechariah, that when God speaks and says something, that it happens? And then, because you didn't believe, Zechariah, you're going to be mute until these things come true here at God's appointed time. Just as a little reminder to you, Zechariah, like when people say, why can't you talk? Well, you can write down what happened here and say, yep. Yeah, Ah, uh, I didn't quite know that God would do this. I didn't quite think he could do this. My wife's too old. My God's too small. I don't believe that anymore, right? 
So let's keep reading verse 21. For Zechariah. And wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. And they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. For he kept making signs to them, but remain unable to speak. Yes, and so like all the other priests, he was in there, but this time a little longer maybe than normal. And when he finally turned and opened the curtain and was supposed to say a prayer of blessing over the people there in the courtyard, he couldn't say anything. And his, he was probably trembling and shaking, and he had just encountered an angel named Gabriel who had come from the presence of God with a message for him. And... Now the people that are watching know that something's up too. Why isn't he praying the prayer of blessing? Now, at that time, there was like, uh, I read something like 20,000 priests who served in the temple. And of course, they all didn't serve at one time. And this opportunity that Zechariah had to be the one priest to burn the incense, the one and the, the, one, the other two left, was, was probably a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and his opportunity to turn and bless the people was a once in a lifetime opportunity right and and God just really upset all of that and you didn't have to be in there with the angel to know that things weren't normal that things weren't right that something's happening and then more people are going to know that something's happening because Matt keep reading when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. Wahoo! <laughs> now people are going to know she's really, really old. <laughs> and the little bump. And what is God doing? Keep going, Matt. And for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Oh, what sweet. She just, just pull out those two little phrases there. The Lord has done it. It's a miracle. The Lord has done this. And then he has shown his favor. The, uh, the, that idea of God's favor keeps showing up in the rest of this chapter a lot. But God has looked on Elizabeth with grace and with mercy and with favor. Their prayers have been answered. They're going to have a baby. Not just any baby, but the special promised baby, John. She becomes pregnant. And the Lord has done this. Isn't that awesome? Continue, Matt. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy... God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. What a similar circumstance to Zechariah. Another announcement of a baby boy being born from the same angel Gabriel. Elizabeth is now six months pregnant, and now Gabriel has another message for Mary. And in verse 27, it says that she was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Uh, so in the, the custom at that time, in the Jewish world, uh, there was actually three steps to marriage. And uh, sometimes in our Bible translations, uh, these words get used interchangeably. But uh, the first step would be what they referred to or, or would be described as an engagement time. But that was 
When the, chi- the children were like four or five, six years old, the parents would actually arrange for their little boy and their little girl. Someday we want them to get married. And the parents, with the wisdom of a parent and knowing in the little village, the little community they were lived, this would be a wonderful little boy for you to marry. And the parents arranged those marriages when the children were really young. And then, probably around uh, the teenage years, age 14, 15, 16, actually, the two children would make a commitment to each other and say, we are now committed to getting married. And that's the stage that Mary was at here. She was betrothed. She was pledged to be married. And she's as good as married legally to Joseph. If that engage that I said engagement if that betrothal period or that period of pledge was broken it actually would take the the writing up of a divorce paper to break that and then somewhere over the next several months the groom would plan this elaborate ceremony and often surprise the bride with a wedding celebration that actually then was the finalized of their wedding and then they would begin to live together and their family would be established. So Mary was in this this kind of middle point where she was committed to being married to Joseph. They just weren't married yet. So that's that's one thing there when when it mentions that she was pledged to be married to Joseph. And here's what the angel said. Like, congratulations, you're going to be the mother of God's son. You're going to be the mother of the ruler of the whole world. Congratulations, you're going to be mother of the son of the most high. You're going to be the mother of the promised Messiah. You're going to be the mother of this promised descendant of King David. You're going to be the mother of Jesus. Meaning, the Savior of the world, the one who saves. Uh, It says there, I feel the same way, John. It says there that she was troubled. Like, that is overwhelming. And in fact, like, Just the angel being there is terrifying. And then this message is just layer upon layer upon layer of this child's really important over and over again. Like, like just slow down, Gabriel. Let's go one at a time through these. And he's just, you know, been waiting for this moment to break into history with this news about the Jesus coming into the world as God's son. And just dumping it out there. Mary, he's the one, the special one, the Messiah. Uh, Jesus, just kind of as an aside, God's son uh, existed and exists for all eternity. Uh, When Mary became pregnant with Jesus was not when Jesus became a person. Wasn't when Jesus became alive. Jesus existed and has existed since the very beginning of time. But in this miracle, in this miracle, Jesus is going to take up residence in a little human cell that's going to allow him to grow and develop like a human being, to take on flesh, to be just like us in every way except sinless. Right? So this wasn't like the, the start of Jesus. And so sometimes when, when we read these passages or our children do, and like Jesus was born, well, that's the start of us when we're born, but that's not the start of Jesus. He's always existed. He's just taking on a new existence. Verse 34, Matt. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. 
Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. And we can just stop there. So Mary, just like Zechariah, asked a very similar question, but apparently there was a different tone, a different motive behind it, different idea behind it, because Mary says, well, how? Apparently it's not in disbelief, but she's just kind of looking for an explanation. All right, well, how's this going to happen? And then once again, Gabriel is just merciless here with, well, think about this. The Holy Spirit will come on you. All right, that, like, how do you even, like, in what way? How will that happen, right? And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Like, today, tomorrow, like how will that happen? What will that be? Maybe this is like that reference to when God's glory appeared in, a, in the temple and in the tabernacle in a cloud or the, the cloud that led the Israelites, like it's God's presence there. It's going to overshadow you like, like, okay. So the Holy One, the sinless one to be born will be called the Son of God. Like, I don't know if that answered all of Mary's questions. think it did I don't think it did but I also don't think it needed to for Mary and as we read more of her story well, that'll, that'll come true and then Gabriel in God's kindness and mercy says hey you're not the only one Mary that's experiencing a miracle and has lots of questions right now you have a relative named Elizabeth and she's six months pregnant and she was barren and wasn't supposed to have any more children. And she's like, there's another miracle going on. So God's up to something here. And then that last little verse, verse 37, for no word from God will ever fail. Nothing is impossible for God. A baby's going to be born. One to someone too old. And one to a virgin who's never had a relation with a relationship with a man. And both babies are going to fulfill God's amazing purposes. Keep going, Matt. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be, word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. You know what Mary said? God, you're my master. And I'm your servant. May your will be done. Everything you've told me, May it come true. And then I don't know how long it took Mary to think about some of these things, but she's going to be pregnant and not yet married to a husband. How do I tell my parents? And how do I tell Joseph? And how do I tell my friends? What's happening to me? Right? Right? Is Joseph going to leave me? What is this going to do to God's reputation? What, like, this is all I got from Gabriel. How am I going to explain this to anybody else? What will people think of me when I'm pregnant and not yet married? But Mary said, nevertheless, may your will be done. I'm your servant. I trust you, God. I trust you. I'm your servant. Keep going, Matt. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as this greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. This is the first. There's going to be several just songs and prayer, praises to God and expressions of thanksgiving in the rest of the book of uh, the chapter one of Luke here. And here's this one. And Mary's quick to go find Elizabeth. Like, let's go talk about somebody else who met Gabriel. Like, like 
we can encourage one another. And is this for real? And uh, what's going on here? And there was somebody with a common experience, right? I could sympathize and empathize and understand with her in this moment. And the Holy Spirit shows up. I think four times in the chapter one, it mentions about the Holy Spirit. Already once with the Holy Spirit coming on Mary to, to conceive the child, right? But somehow the presence of, the, the, of Jesus in the womb was enough through the Holy Spirit to cause John in the womb to leap, to kick, to respond. Like, it's crazy. Neither of the boys are born yet. And God's using them to, to stir up the world around them. Like, wow! Like, as soon as you came in, I knew something was different. It wasn't just the normal little movement of the baby. Something was different here. And there's joy of two women meeting together to talk about their miracle babies. All the questions and all the excitement. Both Mary and Elizabeth were recipients of God's favor. Both believed God. Elizabeth said right in there, the mother of my Lord. Mary, you're the mother of my Lord. Like this little baby that you're carrying is my Lord. That's faith, right? Like you're the mother of my Lord. And then in verse 45, it says, blessed is she, Mary, who has believed. All right, there's just another Another confirmation that Mary just believed God and trusted God. And God's going to carry this out and make it happen. And then we go on to verse 46. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. And these next few verses are just filled with so many words of praise and truth. That right off the bat, this tells me a little bit about the character of Mary. She didn't say, boy, it must be special that the angel would come to me. Huh. I'm favored by God. No. It's all about God. My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My Savior and the Savior of the world. Who? Jesus. Call his name Jesus, right? For he has been mindful of the humble state of a servant. I'm no one special. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends. Verse 51, he has performed mighty deeds. 52, he has brought down rulers, but has lifted up the humble. Verse 53, he has filled the hungry, but sent the rich away empty. Verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Just praise to God of all the amazing things that she knew of, of the God that's been taught to her, the God that was revealed in the Old Testament. And then also just this idea right near the end. He has helped his servant Israel to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised. I mean, Mary's mind is going back to the very beginning of the promises of the, that were given to Abraham. 2,000 years before this time, God had promised that someone would come and bring a blessing to the whole world. And she's like, that same God is the God that's doing something now. Right? He's, he's the God. And just as he promised our ancestors, I'm a recipient of some more of those promises. And then Matt, Verse 56, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. And keep going, please. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. 
Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened, and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. So the son that Gabriel, that God had promised to them, is born. God's merciful. There was joy. It was promised. The, the angel promised uh, Zechariah nine months earlier that this son would bring joy. And already he is bringing joy to those that were there when he was born. And John's parents listened to God. They named him John. They said his name is John. It's been John all along. God established that. That's set. We're not going to change that. And then Zechariah's first words were words of praise. And then the people that were there who had witnessed this miracle said, what in the world? This is a special child. What will this? What is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. This is no ordinary baby. And then we close off the chapter with the song of Zechariah. And Zechariah, verse 67, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit shows up again, and he prophesied. And his first words here are not about, God, thank you for my son, but they're words directed to God and about Jesus. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn, a ruler of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. As he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Again, there's this this thought that that thread going through here of this is the God who fulfills his promises his covenant and mentions Abraham his holy covenant it mentions David it mentions Israel like these were the the leaders the fathers of his of the Jewish people that God had spoken promises to and these promises are being fulfilled and it's the promise of salvation it's the promise of salvation that's going to enable us to serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness. Right? That Jesus is going to come. God's making a way for us to be holy, like become new people inside, and then we can do right things. In verse 76, and you, my child, he's referring to his newborn son, John, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation, there it is again, through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Jared, give us the next slide, please. Let's just uh, draw some truths out of here as we close. And if you've not written much down, I would encourage you to at least write down one from each of these, these uh, next couple of slides. What are some lessons that we can learn from this story in Luke chapter 1? First lesson is be faithful in the role that God has asked you to play. John and Jesus, they're considered great men. They had a public ministry, but both of them were dependent on, in a sense, Mary and Zechariah and Elizabeth. And there was nothing great and flashy about Mary, Zechariah, or Elizabeth. They were just ordinary people from an obscure village, and it even says that Elizabeth and Zechariah lived in the hill country. There's not even a named town for them. And yet they were faithful, and they played their role 
as God asked them to do to bring John and Jesus into this world. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I urge you, church, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, 1. We're God's. Whatever role we have to present our bodies to him. Uh, we just finished a study in Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, it says that God's given some to be have leadership roles in the church and others to have different roles, but everyone is to do works of service so that the church, the body of Christ, will be built up. In Ephesians 5 and 6, the last few weeks, we were studying about the different roles that God has for parents and children for husbands and wives, for masters and slaves. And in all those places, to be faithful, whatever role you have. Number two, trust God's goodness, even when many questions are left unanswered. Matt, could you read thir verses 38 and 45 of the passage we just looked at? I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Okay, so again, Mary didn't have all the answers and could not even begin to grasp the miracle that what God was doing. But she trusted that God was good and she said yes to God. And no word of God is powerless. It's a humble, patient faith to trust God, to take him at his word, to trust his goodness, even when it would get difficult for her and Joseph, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. That's a wonderful one to put to memory and to think about because that's what Mary had to do. Trust in the Lord, because I got no understanding in this one, right? And he'll direct the paths. In Habakkuk chapter 3, the very end of this passage where a prophet is questioning God and trying to get answers, and he finally just throws up his hands and prays and says, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes in the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. God's got the power and the goodness and he loves me. And he'll take me through the journey when there's a whole lot of questions. Uh, both Mary and uh, Zechariah and us today come with a lot of questions. Is the font big enough? How's this going to happen? How's this going to work out? What's in store for me? And isn't this kind of cool? Just switch it. <laughs> God's got it. Trust the person of Jesus and God. And turn your house into who? Right? Like, he's got it. Trust in the Lord. He'll make my feet like Heinz feet so I can go on the heights. We'll never have all of our questions answered. Life is fun. It's an adventure. It's a mystery like that. But if we had all of our questions answered and we had it all figured out, we wouldn't need the who, would we? And so may God help us to turn our questions and our doubts and our fears into directing our attention to the who. And all through Luke chapter 1, 
when Mary's life and Zechariah's life and Elizabeth's life has been turned upside down for the glory of God, they just kept praising God, thinking about the who. Number three, pray with confidence that God can still do the impossible. Verse 13 of Luke 1, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Okay, uh, why were they praying? Well, for a son, but why were they praying? Because as soon as the angel said, God's going to give you a son, well, no, he's not. There's no way that's going to happen. Right? Like, maybe they had stopped the prayer years ago when they realized it's not going to happen and it's too hard and it's impossible. Or maybe they were still just saying the prayer, but there wasn't much meaning to it anymore because God's forgotten us. Right? I don't know why, like, he's praying and the angel said, God's heard your prayers. And then Zechariah's like, well, uh, my prayer's been answered? <laughs> like, it just seems really interesting there, but... You know, I believe, but do we really believe in our life and in our practice? Like, do we really believe that God can do that and might do that? Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and by your arched, outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard. Ephesians 3:20. From our passage in Ephesians that we just studied. Now to him is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. According to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations. Forever and ever. To him who is able to do more abundantly. He's got the power and he can do that. Are there any things in your prayer list that would take a miracle? God keep us safe as we drive to grandma's house for Christmas. Well, most of the time God keeps us safe. Is that it's okay to pray that, but that's kind of an easy prayer. Because God usually comes through for that. But what about the hard ones? Do you have any impossible prayers on your list? Do you believe that God can tear down the walls around North Korea and allow the gospel to go into that country? Do you believe and pray that God could save President Xi of China? He could. I pray for that. Do you believe that God can restore someone who's turned their back on God? doesn't even believe in God anymore and that God could bring them back to himself and back to believing that God can fix a broken marriage I guess I would encourage us this third point to think through do you have any impossible things on your prayer list and keep praying them with faith keep giving them to God and see what he does all right next one number four pray with perseverance So stick with it. Jesus said in Luke 18, he told his disciples a, a parable about a persistent widow. And it says that they should always pray and not give up. Uh, sometimes it takes a really long time for God to answer prayers. All throughout Luke 1, they've been waiting for centuries for the birth of John and the birth of Jesus. At least 400 years when Malachi closed to when the New Testament opened up. There, would have been, there was no movement at all, like no hint that John's anywhere close. And for generation after generation, they kept waiting and praying and waiting for the Messiah who was promised. And I just want to encourage you to don't give up when God doesn't answer your prayer within a week. 
Because it's too bad that we live in a culture and a society where we want everything instant. And we get impatient at the drive through waiting for a sandwich. And we get impatient at the microwave. And we don't know God's perfect timetable. So persevere and keep praying and don't give up. Number five, pray with praise to God. Uh, Mary's song and Zechariah's song. In both of those passages, there's at least 10 references to passages in the Old Testament from the Psalms and from the prophets. God, you're merciful. God, you're holy. The Lord of salvation. Right? All of these things just, fl just flowed out of Zechariah and Mary in their praise to God. And uh, January the 18th of last year, I was sitting at Children's Hospital and Brenda, you hadn't shown up yet, but Psalm 23 was in my heart and mind. I didn't have a Bible with me, and I just started to pray and read and remember that the Lord is my shepherd, and he leads and he guides, and I didn't know what would happen and what God's plans were for Enoch, but those verses kept coming back, and Psalm 23, he prepares a feast for me in the presence of enemies. I felt like I had a lot of enemies, a lot of unanswered questions. But God's word gave me hope, and it's just words of praise. God, you've got it. You're my shepherd. Please, read the Old Testament. Read the Psalms. Read those truths about God. And when you pray, just let them flow out of you. God, you're so merciful. You're gracious. You're kind. That's what Mary did. That's what Zechariah did. Number six, God has not forgotten those in a humble state. Verse 48, Matt. He has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. That was the words of, of Mary. He's not forgotten you. God's not just concerned about the important people. His eyes are on all of us. Nahum 1.7 says, The Lord is good, a strength and stronghold in a day of trouble. He knows, he recognizes, he cares for, and he understands fully those who take refuge and trust in him. There's none that God has forgotten. Psalm 138.6, For the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Or James 4, 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So don't think you've been forgotten by God. You haven't. Number seven. Don't forget the great things that God has done. Verse 49. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Can you write down? Some great things that God has done for you. Isaiah 12, verse 4. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make his words known among the peoples. Declare his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the earth. Cry out and sing, O citizens of Zion. For great among you is the Holy One of Israel. Parents, your kids need to hear you tell, talk about the great things that God's doing. And kids, your parents need to hear you talk about the great things that God's doing. And grandparents, you've lived the longest. I hope you have a long list of the great things that God has done. Number eight, remember the word of God will never fail. Or nothing is impossible with God as we read there in Luke 1, 37. All throughout chapter one. This is kind of just another little way to say it. But you know what? God's word can be counted on and it's true. And it may not happen in our lifetime. It may not happen for generations and generations. But you know what? Someday we're going to dwell with God and God with us. 
and he will wipe every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for all this old stuff has passed away. Revelation 21. And that's true. And we can count on it. And finally, number nine, let go and release your child to the Lord's calling in their life. Verse 66, Matt. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Mary and Elizabeth, with all their questions and the joy of the birth of a baby, did you know that both of them lost their sons around the age of 30? And that was God's plan for John to be beheaded for being faithful to God. And that was God's plan for Jesus to go to the cross. Great joy is often accompanied by a big task and a great burden. And in 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth wherever that might be, that God leads them. And however God chooses to use them. And his plans are not always the plans of mom and dad. So parents, release your kids to do whatever God asks them to do. That they'll live for God all the days of their life. Come on, Grace and Sarah.